<laughs> All right, good evening, everybody. This is a special meeting of the Downers Grove Grade School District 58 Board of Education meeting here on Thursday, February 10th, 2022 at 5 p.m. at the Downers Grove Village Hall. This meeting is being live streamed from the pub for the public on the Village of Downers Grove's YouTube channel. Melissa, will you please call roll? Member Doshi is absent. Member Ellis? Here. Member Hannes? Here. Member Harris? Here. Member Olchik? Here. Member Weiner? Here. Member Hughes? Here. Tonight, members of the audience will have an opportunity to provide public comment to the board. I have increased the time tonight from 30 minutes to allot 60 minutes for public comment tonight. The board has asked anyone wishing to comment to please fill out a card and indicate the topic to be addressed. These can be placed in the basket over there on the table to my right. We will do our best to make sure as many people as possible to comment within this time frame. Depending on how many cards we receive, this may mean that we need to reduce the time allotted. But as of right now, I have allotted um, two minutes and ask for anybody so that we have the opportunity to give everybody to speak to keep your comments as concise as possible. Um, anticipating that there will be more comments than, than we particularly hear in a single meeting, Dr. Russell has shared a comment uh, form in the most recent email. Uh, so over like what, the last 48 hours, I think those were coming in, right? Mm -hmm. um, we did receive over 350 comments there, and the board has had an opportunity to, to review all of those um, before we met here today. As we always do, we're going to start with a, a flag salute, so everyone please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, starting us off tonight is going to be Dr. Russell with the superintendent report. Good evening, everyone. First off, I want to thank everyone for coming out to the Village Hall tonight. I know this is an earlier meeting than usual uh, because it's a special meeting, but again, I want to thank everyone. I also want to thank everyone who can't be here but contributed comments to us on our form. Again, I want to reiterate what the board president shared. We have taken the time to read all of those comments, um, and so we appreciate everyone's feedback. And just as a reminder, those comments will be posted on board docs uh, so the public can see what the citizens share. Okay, so as we get into our report, I want to talk about the objectives for tonight's meeting. So tonight we hope to provide a brief overview of the current landscape in Illinois regarding COVID-19 mitigations. I want to share some recent events, state of the district as a whole as it uh, relates to mitigations. We certainly want to listen to public feedback. And the main goal is to provide clarity moving forward for the community. So tonight the board will be uh, asked to vote on a mass recommended policy. That means a mass optional policy contingent upon court rulings and or the lifting of Governor Pritzker's mass mandate. So as we make this vote tonight or as the board considers this vote, here are the factors that we consider as we you know, embark on this. So first off, we're always looking for the health and safety of students and staff. So we look closely with the IDPH guidelines. Why are we looking at the IDPH guidelines? Because as a public school district in Illinois, that is the health governing body that we, we always look at. The IDPH guidance calls for layered mitigations during the pandemic. We're always, like oops, sorry, thank little, you. Yeah. We're always looking to prioritize in-person instruction. One of the things that I really feel strongly about is doing everything that we can, and I know this board feels strongly, to make sure that our kids are in person. Um, our teachers did a wonderful job with remote learning, but I think we can all agree that in-person instruction is the best form of instruction, and it's the most important thing. And so everything we do is with that lens, how do we make sure that we keep kids in school and avoid a scenario where we go remote? We are also keenly aware of a path toward normalcy. Sorry, there's a typo in there. We were working on this this afternoon. Providing our students with a normal opportunity. What does school look like prior to the pandemic? That is always what we're aiming for. I'm a father of seven school-aged children. I want my kids to have a normal experience. All the board members up here also have children in the schools. That is another priority that we're always trying to consider. Of course, we always want to make sure that we're providing our students with those rigorous instructional opportunities as well. During this pandemic, we have seen more social emotional needs from our children than ever before, and also from our staff and community. 
So how are we paying attention to that is also a very important thing to us. We always want to find ways to continue to support our students and staff. And when we can and when it's appropriate, parental choice is something that's a philosophy of this Board of Education and myself as the superintendent. We always want to give parents as many choices as possible as appropriate. So what have we learned so far from the pandemic? Unfortunately, our state leaders have not really ever provided us with a clear path forward. And I've also learned that there's really good people in Downers Grove. I went to high school in Downers Grove, I taught in Downers Grove. So many of you in the audience also grew up here. We are a great community. And we are also a community that has different views. And people have legitimate views and concerns on both sides. But I will also tell you that communities have been torn apart over the last two and a half years. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. It's been one of the most devastating impacts of this pandemic is to see how communities are being torn apart. And one of the things that breaks my heart about the current situation is I think we can all see the light at the end of the tunnel with Governor Pritzker's announcement that you know, for indoor places, the public masking ban will be lifted on the 28th. But yet here we are again as communities, not just District 58, but all over the state of Illinois. And we're, we're thrown into this chaos and turmoil again. It's not something that any of us want. Trust me, I can, I can speak for everyone in this room. And I will also tell you that the suburbs are very split on this issue. As, as you look around, you know, there are certain communities in the state of Illinois where masking isn't even a question. Everybody wants it. There are other communities in Illinois that people don't want it. And then there are communities in Illinois where no matter what decision is made, people on one side are not gonna be happy with the outcome. And this pandemic has certainly taught me that. One of the things though I do wanna be very honest and I wanna make the community aware, we are seeing a growing hostility toward public boards and staff. I wanna share with you a story from O'Neill Middle School this week where the principal received a voice message because someone was angry about a mask. The caller, who was a family member of a student, told the principal that he hopes he gets cancer, kills himself, and dies because of a mask mandate. I can tell you I've been accused of child abuse because I asked the community for a couple of days to look into this. We can all disagree, and you can certainly attack any decision that I make, but attacking people's character is going above it, you know, and it, it's something that we have to get a control on in, in our community. I recognize that the overwhelming majority of people would never say anything like that or do anything like that. But those misguided accusations do have an impact. They have an impact on our students. They have an impact on our staff. We are experiencing burnout from this pandemic like you've never seen before. There is an educator shortage. And there are many in this profession, even in District 58, that are looking at the current landscape and saying, I'm not doing this anymore. It's just not worth it. And so no matter what decisions get made, I want everybody to keep that in the back of their mind. We've got great people who work in this district who are invested in your children. And we wanna make sure that we don't lose them. And so please keep that in mind. One of the things I share with people when they write emails and if they are nasty or sometimes I say, you know, with all due respect, there's a real person on the other end of this email who's just trying to do everything that he can for kids. Again, everyone is welcome to criticize our decisions. That is fair game. But the character assassinations, the accusations, I'm respectfully asking the community to tone that down. When we get up to public comment tonight, speak passionately about your views. But please, no character attacks, no misguided accusations. We're better than that as a community. I know we can do better than that. We have done better than that throughout the entire pa pandemic. We gotta bring civility back, and we have to get rid of these appalling statements that are being thrown around all across the board. I wanna commend the board and our staff. I know we've got principals in the back of the room and teachers. They've met every challenge throughout this pandemic. None of you signed up for this. None of us signed up for this. Every week there's something new that we didn't anticipate, that no one could have anticipated. But I'm very proud of the staff of District 58. I'm very proud of the teachers in the classroom, the administrators in the schools. What they've been able to do has been amazing. And I'm very proud of our families. This isn't easy. As I shared before, I've got many kids. And I live this as a parent every day too, so I know what everybody's going through. 
The last point I want to make about lessons from the pandemic, there's not a perfect solution. If I had it, I would have already given it to you. I want you to know that. Okay, so why are we here tonight? Well, we had a court ruling Friday evening that was very ambiguous, not very clear. I know that there are some people in the community who said this, there's nothing complex about it. The entire state is in turmoil over this court ruling. Trust me, it is complex. There are many layers that we have to go through. And so that's why we're here tonight. We did need time for clarity, especially on the two separate rulings and how they may or may not have impacted our school district. We had to seek key answers. We had to make sure that we talk with our insurance provider. When you get a ruling at five o'clock on Friday night, they don't pick up the phone on Saturday or Sunday. We have to wait till Monday morning. And so as I'm getting emails on Saturday night and, and people are saying, be a leader, make a decision. I can't just make a snap decision. I need to have time. Now I realize that some districts did come right out of the gate and make a decision. Those districts were named in the lawsuit. We were not. There's a big difference when you're named in the lawsuit and have to make a decision based on that versus not being named and trying to figure out what's going on. We had to check with the health department. We had to check with local school districts. There's a lot that have to go into that. One of the things I want to point out too, why this is a special meeting versus an emergency meeting. As soon as we got that clarity, we did schedule a special meeting. That's why it's on Thursday. You have to post a special meeting for 48 hours to be in line with the Open Meetings Act. You cannot post an emergency meeting if there is not an emergency. Since we were not named in the lawsuit and we were already in school, that wouldn't qualify for an emergency. So if we called an emergency meeting and the board took action, and let's say they voted for a mask optional policy and someone challenged that with a public access counselor, the ruling could be null and void, we'd be right back where we started and we had to come back again. And so I recognize that people wanted an immediate answer. You deserve to have an answer for me of why you couldn't get that immediate answer. And the other reason is as superintendent, I do not set the direction for the community. Your elected officials set the direction for the community. Boards of education have to weigh in on this. The board has been very clear since we started the pandemic. So long as we're following the guidance and the mandate, I don't need to come back to the board. If something changes, I do have to come back to the board and let your elected officials weigh in. That's what the democratic process is all about. I realize that some people are upset with Governor Pritzker for making a unilateral decision. The remedy to that is not having your superintendent make a unilateral decision. It is to come in front of the board and have a community conversation where all can be heard. So what are we asking the board to vote on tonight? We're asking the board to approve a resolution that delegates authority to the superintendent for the following. To keep the current IDPH mitigations in place except for, number one, unvaccinated school employees will no longer have to submit to weekly testing. Excuse me. I'm not good at driving this at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Told you, Dr. Aguilar. Number two, close contacts will not be required to be excluded from school. To remind everyone a close contact is someone that is not symptomatic or is tested positive. Students and staff will not be required to wear a mask in schools. Face masks still will be required on district transportation. Why? District transportation is under the federal mandate, not the state mandate. So people still have to wear masks on buses. This could only take place if there's not a stay in the executive, or excuse me, in the TRO, the TRO fails to be overturned or the governor's mandate expires or is withdrawn. So basically, what I'm asking the board to vote on this evening is a mask optional policy so long as the court doesn't rule that school districts can't do that or the governor withdraws that. So what would this look like in our schools if this took place? Instructional spacing would still remain at three feet. Lunch and recess would be handled in the same manner they are today. If you go back to one of those original slides that I talked about, it's a layered mitigation process. So what the guidance tells us is you take a measured approach, you take away layers. So if we're starting with face masks with close contacts, we see how that goes for a while and then you continue on in that process. Staff will have the ability to maintain six feet of distancing in instructional spaces to the greatest extent possible. An additional PPE like N95 masks will be offered to staff upon request. We do have additional 
N95 masks for students of low income if they needed that. But the problem with those is sometimes the student faces aren't big enough for those things. And so we would have to work that out on an individual basis. We continue to strongly recommend, not require the implementation of other safety measures such as the use of hand sanitizer, hand washing, et cetera. Discussions then would happen at every grade level to support students to feel comfortable in their learning environment. I want to remind every student, and everybody knows this, has, they've had masks on for two years. If that suddenly changes for our elementary students when they're four, five, six, seven, that requires some conversations with kids. Families with students who have a medical condition that may require additional accommodations are encouraged to work with their building principal and their student support team so we can continue to make accommodations. And again, masks would be recommended, but optional for visitors. So my recommendation would be for the board to adopt that resolution as written. There's some key points though that I need the public to know and for the board to consider. District 58 would still recommend everyone follows the IDPH guidance. Again, there's a difference between recommending and requiring. Why am I still recommending that? Since the start of that pandemic, I've been clear, I am not a public health expert. We're gonna recommend what the public health experts say. It's up to parents though in this situation how they feel comfortable with that. The recommendation is in accordance with the guidance and it takes a layered approach. Key questions have been answered and it continues us on this path of a return to normal. It is in line with what we're seeing across the state of Illinois with other districts, private schools as well. And certainly Illinois is one of the last states to let this happen. But there are a ton of examples of how this works throughout the country and in the state of Illinois, and really even here in Downers Grove, when you look at our private schools that have been doing this for a couple of days. And this does, of course, allow for parental choice. One thing, though, I have to make clear to the community, and we've been in this world before with, with required mandates. If approved, a court ruling could result in reverting back to the governor's full mandate. And so what that means is if we have a court of law that tells the school districts in Illinois you have to abide by this, then, then we would have to abide by that court ruling. So you could have a situation where masks come off and then they're required to come back on for a period of time. That's out of our control. We don't like that situation. We want consistency for our kids. And so that is one thing that obviously is concerning if you go back and forth, back and forth. However, throughout this pandemic, I think we've all been back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, and so that resiliency is there and built up. I also wanna, you know, when, when we talk to our staff, when we talk to our principals, you know, one of the common themes was, we do need some time to ensure everything is ready to go and conversations can take place with students. I think our staff are very concerned if we pass something at six or seven at night, if the board did decide to go in this direction, and not being able to talk with our staffs about what this means. So in a perfect world, what I would be recommending is that we would start this on Monday so we could take time to have conversations with kids tomorrow. We could take time to meet with our principals tomorrow morning and we could make sure everything is, is ready to go. We don't do that in education unless the board approves that, right? We don't wanna circumvent the board and so that's why those conversations haven't taken place in full yet. Also for the board about any recommendation I give, I wish there was a perfect answer that could unite everyone about this topic. There isn't. And I understand that no matter what recommendation gets made, that people are gonna have concerns. One of the things that we've done throughout this pandemic though, is we've really done a nice job of making sure that we have conversations with kids, we have conversations with families, and we will get there. Throughout this pandemic, we've had many points like this where People were scared about maybe going the next step or they had legitimate safety concerns. We've always done a nice job of working through that. So with that, before we get to public comment, are there any board questions? None for me. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Russell. Thank you, Dr. Russell. I know it has been a long six days because I we may have talked more than you and your wife have talked over those <laughs> six days. Um, I, I know I know it was hard, and so for all of you that were able to give us some patience while we figured it out, it was it was stressful. 
knowing that we didn't even have an opportunity to hear from the health department until uh, Monday afternoon. Uh, when you get this information on a Friday, it, it leads to a lot of stress, but we appreciate our law firm and all, and all the other groups that we were able to consult with over this time. And I just want to reiterate, we, you know, we've had a wonderful community. This has been a hard two years, but for the most part, we've seen a tremendous amount of respect. And I hope we can continue that today, even though I, I'm sure there are people in this room that are not going to agree with each other um, tonight while we listen to public comment. So this is an opportunity for members of the audience to share public comment with the board, but it is not intended for a time for members of the public to enter into a dialogue with the board. Issues raised during public comment today may be added to future agendas or addressed by administrative staff as appropriate. Please, criticisms of individuals is not in order. The board has extended our public comment time up to an hour today, 60 minutes. We ask everyone to keep comments to a two minute limit to allow everybody to speak because we do have 26 cards and I really would like to have an opportunity to make sure we hear uh, everybody's voice today. At, um, we ask that each of you who submitted a card to please come up when I mention your name, state your name in your attendance area, and then provide your public comment. We do have a countdown clock going on tonight and, and it's in two locations, so as you kind of see your time running down, if you could quickly wrap up your comments so that we, could, we can move on and, and, and hear from everybody uh, this evening. Um, first up tonight we have Angelique Stacy. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. And I just want to say thank you to the board and Dr. Russell. You all have been amazing through this. This has been so difficult. I'm sure none of you thought, oh, I'm going to become a public health expert. I'm going to try to learn virology. I'm going to try to learn public, you know, shutting schools down, opening schools up. So I just want to say thank you very much. Um, I also want to say thank you for pushing to go remote when you did pushing to go full schedule when you did, when you had a lot of naysayers telling people that uh, all kinds of awful, awful things. So thank you very much for doing that. And we have that same faith in this board tonight. We know that neighboring districts have been difficult. We know that our high school has having problems right now. And we know District 58 is awesome. District 58 listens to their parents. District 58 listens to the community. That's all I want to say is thank you. I remember what happened a year ago. I remember the path we took to get here, and I appreciate it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dana Cox from Bel Air. The name wrong? I see no, okay. it's coming. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board and administration of 58. Thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of my husband and three children who attend sco all uh, two schools in District 58. I am not only a parent. But I'm now also a certified substitute teacher in DuPage County and helping out at District 58 as well. Tonight I'm asking you to allow parents a choice, allow families to make their own decision on whether to mask or unmask their children. My family respects both choices that parents may choose. And we would appreciate the same in return. As for our community, we need to do better. Please end this scare tactic and allow our children to learn to their fullest potential. And please, members of the board, Dr. Russell, we honor, please honor our civil duty by providing a fair and equitable education to our children as outlined in the U.S. Constitution. May you provide liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Megan McKenzie Kingsley. Hi, my name is Megan, and I have a fifth and first grader at Kingsley, along with an incoming kindergartner next year. 
I stand before you today to share my personal experience and how COVID and long-term mask wearing has directly affected my family. My oldest is diagnosed with high anxiety and OCD, and we are in the beginning phases of having my first grader evaluated due to extreme changes in her mental health of, over the past few years. My incoming kindergartner has struggled with speech and was forced to attend speech sessions within the district last year with a mask on. We all now know that mask wearing and speech issues are counterproductive. One thing I can tell you is that my first grader used to be the most easygoing and happy child until COVID hit and her only public school experience she's ever known has been affected by this pandemic. She's now an anxiety ridden child who cries frequently about having to go to school in a mask. She wakes up several times a night crying about fears she can't even begin to explain and isn't getting the adequate amount of sleep she needs to properly retain information at school every day. There is no doubt in my mind that attending kindergarten only a few hours a day on Zoom, spending her days in first grade with a mask covering her face, being unable to see expressions on her teachers and friends faces, being isolated at separate small tables to eat lunch and being yelled at by staff if her mask slips down on her face slightly is most definitely the culprit of all the issues we are now dealing with on a daily basis. Though academics have always come easy for me, my fifth grader, for my fifth grader, her mental health has no doubt suffered tremendously over the last few years. Last year, we saw a significant increase in her OCD behaviors that sent her in a downward spiral. She rotated through different obsessive behaviors to try and calm her mind and ease her frustrations of not seeing friends, sports not being normal, and school being affected by masks. Then one night, my worst nightmare as a parent came true, and she shared some incredibly scary thoughts with me that she had been having. She was at a breaking point and no longer felt like she could handle it. This is obviously something we did not take lightly. And with no hope that we could turn to the school for support, we sought therapy at the cost of almost $10,000 through a facility that was not covered by insurance. This was in addition to other efforts to get her back to feeling herself. This is the third school year that is being affected by this. When does it end? The least vulnerable population is being punished seconds, and suffering please, tremendously. Hear from everybody. Okay, just 10 more. I, hey, uh, excuse me, Megan, if you'd like to leave your statement with us, I'd be happy to take it so that the whole board can hear the whole thing. Thank you. And Jane, no, are, are you able to turn that off? Yeah. Like, how is that working? Just so yeah. people... We apologize. It's that okay. was not intended to be that loud. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is the third school year that is being affected by this. When does it end? The least vulnerable population is being punished and suffering tremendously. It's time for our district to start prioritizing our children's mental health and allow families the choice. I have never discounted this virus and I am very aware that it has negatively impacted a significant amount of people, but there must be a time when we return to normal. I believe the choice should be up to each individual family to do as they feel is right for them. Enough is enough. I ask you to please consider making masks optional as soon as possible to preserve what is left of our children's mental health. Mark, Mark Filing, Pierce Downer. Hi, my name is Mark Fillin and I have two children in elementary school here in District 58. I'm here in support of masks being optional for our kids in school. The time is now, the tide has turned nationally and locally, and the dominoes continue to fall as more and more surrounding districts choose to go mask optional for our kids. Illinois is one of just soon to be five states to still impose masks on school children. Illinois pediatric hospitalizations have risen and fallen at a similar rate to our maskless neighbors during Omicron per the CDC and Kaiser Family Foundation. To date, there are still no studies that masks in schools have been an effective preventative measure. We do, however, have data and evidence showing the many detriments of wearing a mask, such as language and speech development, depression and empathy, just to name a few. When I watched the governor's press conference yesterday and had some time to process it, I came to the conclusion that reason and common sense had gone out the window from those leaders and health officials. The only science I saw was political science. Let's just break down the absurdity of what was said yesterday. The mask mandate would go away February 28th, but the mandates for schools would stay in place. So in essence, my children will be safe when going maskless into stores, restaurants, other establishments, but can catch and spread COVID in school only. I'm not a doctor or a scientist, but using common sense and reason, I can't even process such nonsense. Children are the least affected by the virus, thank God. 
with the flu being five times more likely to cause hospitalization or worse. So I have to ask, what are we doing? This wonderful group of parents, children, and families that surround me are not here to win some political game. We're not trying to take away masks and vaccines from those who disagree with us. All we want is choice. All we want is freedom. All we want is due process of the law. The nightmare needs to end. I love my kids. I love my community. We can do this together. To the board and teachers and staff, thank you. Thank you every, for everything you do. We have your backs. I hope you have ours. There's still time to make the right decision. Please do. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Josh Hearn. Hello, my name is Joshua Hearn. I'm a District 58 parent. My wife and I have four children with our oldest being a first grader at Pierce Downer. Having a child who has only known school through the pandemic, it is worrisome how young learners in this community are being academically and developmentally affected by COVID mitigations. I've heard about the learning gaps due to the COVID-19 shutdowns all over the news. But has anyone thought about the effects of the endless masking that we're having? The shutdowns ended a long time ago, but the universal masking has now has not. Two years later, it's still going on. Even in an affluent area like Downers Grove, the first grade Ames Web assessment showed a 43 showed that 43 percent of first grade students need intensive intervention to achieve grade level literacy. The literacy map scores also showed lower scores. Grades K through second suffered the most as those were the ages where it is necessary for students to see a teacher's mouth move in order to learn letter sounds, sound out letters and words. Young students also need to see their teachers and peers faces and smiles in order to develop a love for school and learning. Even, even though teachers have done their very best to make this happen, it is impossible to say to say children are receiving the same type of interactions in school as before the pandemic. This is especially concerning for the young grades where they have never known how great school can, can be with true social interactions with adults and peers. Does anyone notice how when someone is speaking in front of a crowd on TV, they remove their mask so they are understood and not muffled? Why is this not happening in our classrooms? Our famous governor removed his mask a number of times yesterday during his televised speech as he completely manhandled it to stuff it in his pocket every time he was going up to speak. <laughs> mask Masking is detrimental, but most kids wear the masks all day without complaining because they're obeying their parents and teachers' requests. It's our duty as parents to explain to our children what is good, bad, healthy, unhealthy, and to protect them. This is why it's the parents in our community fighting for the masks to become optional. Our children have suffered enough over the past two years. I would urge the board to band together with the other districts and put this political game to bed. Thank you. Sarah Rusan, Island. Don't start yet, I have to pull up my phone here. Okay, um, hi, I'm Sarah Rusan. I'm a parent at um, obviously District 58. My daughter goes to Highland. Um, wherever this lands tonight, I think we can all agree that our kids' mental health has suffered over the past two years. Each family has been impacted in some way with a loss during this pandemic. Whether through illness or death of a loved one, loss of job security or changes to career or intangible losses from failed expectations, missed opportunities like graduations or first experiences, milestones and events, we have faced isolation and loneliness. This has taken a toll on every person of every age. And while we did our best to shield our children from the real burdens we carried, their small shoulders carried them as well. Together we are bonded by this grief. And, together, and tonight we are reminded why we have, um, we are reminded we have a shared goal. I look around this room and I can feel the love and protectiveness and hope that all of these parents are holding for their children, for our children. 
And I want to take a moment and hold space for and honor each other and these big feelings. Tonight, you will hear compelling and passionate statements from different sides and be faced with another difficult decision that shouldn't be yours to make. I am disappointed in our state leadership and health department that the role of public health expert has fallen onto your shoulders once again. I hope that the decisions made tonight are done by following the data and logic that can help support any future policy changes the district may need to make responses to surges or variants. My request tonight is not just for the board or the district, but a plea to our families to make a commitment to each other. We came tonight because we recognize the mental health impact this pandemic has had on our children. The risk benefit is being reconsidered. But what, uh, um, although I'm hoping we can develop a logical path forward, we need to take into consideration to have a plan that addresses the mental well-being of our children in the how we roll this off-ramp plan out. Just as there are very legitimate medical reasons why someone wears a mask, there are very real reasons and needs for a child not to. May I finish? Yes. Yeah, Thank you. 10 seconds. Um, severely immunocompromised, too young to get vaccinated, struggling with anxiety, sensory processing disorders, physical impairments, hearing loss, and learning dif uh, difficulties. My list is not exhaustive and isn't intended to highlight one importance over the other. We are hearing across districts of people pitting each other up against each other, kids that don't want to sit next to other kids because one is masked and one is not, people that are, are judging or posting other pictures of their kids on social media because they are the other than what they are. The implications of bullying on a mask issue leads to further stigmatizing mental and physical health, welcomes intolerance and discrimination, and takes us further away from our goal and need of addressing our kids' mental health. I don't say these things with judgment. These are big feelings, and we need to find a way through them. As parents, friends, need, neighbors, we, we and educators, we have very real opportunity to model and teach uh, an incredible value, an incredibly valuable life lesson these next few weeks, and I'm looking to the district to just help provide the right tools and resources to our schools, teachers, and families so we can roll this out the right way. Thank, Thank you for the extra time. Rebecca Padalek from Leicester. Good evening. Thank you, board, for being here for us tonight and allowing us to speak our thoughts and concerns on this matter. I am a health professional, frontline worker. My husband is an ER physician, so we've been on the front lines from the day one of this pandemic. I watched him with fear as he walked out of the door, not having the equipment he needed to face this pandemic, and we were scared. But very quickly, we began to realize that those fears were not really based on facts and our community was being lied to by the media, and those numbers did not add up. My background in healthcare is in ICU for over eight years, then I moved to ER. I can tell you how an ICU works, a lot of people don't understand it. So when you hear on the news that our ICUs are full or at capacity with COVID, that's not necessarily the case. Just like we are seeing in teachers, we're seeing a mass exodus in nursing. We are underappreciated, underpaid, and after the past three years, you can only imagine the, the trauma that some of us have gone through. With that mass exodus, what you are seeing now is we have severe staffing ratios, and I'm sure you can understand those as you're battling some of those things as well. Now the number of patients that we're able to care for is minimized. That does not mean that COVID is as much of a crisis as it was two years ago. That just means the staff that's there to handle it is kind of tired. That doesn't mean there's as many sick people as the news would like to portray. It just means we might have one nurse that has to handle three or four patients where that previous ratio was only two to one. The concern goes forward as to when does this end? When do we begin to put a pause on some of these thoughts that this is just a dire strait of COVID is going to kill us if we catch it? I could place my life on the line to say that probably every one of us in this room have had a variant of COVID. Whether you knew it or tested for it, Omicron or Delta, somebody in here has had it. I also recognize and don't take away from the severity that somebody in here has passed from it that was a loved one of ours. But what I say is let's our children be free to be children. They are our least vulnerable and I respect that this board will do the right thing by our children. Thank you.
very pretty handwriting, but I'm still having a hard time reading it. Uh, maybe. Michaela, maybe? Coltec? Am I even close? Welcome. Hello, my name is Michaela Cotter. I'm in seventh grade at Herrick Middle School. March of 2019, my life changed. I was no longer allowed to go to school. I was no longer allowed to see my friends. I was no longer allowed to leave my house. Eventually, it became class online, which led to finally being able to return in person. In-person school no longer looked the same. We had strict rules that we had to follow. That was not the way to end my sixth grade year at Leicester. I realized very quickly that our opinions did not matter. I did not have a say. Due to the fear of COVID, we had to wear masks and remain six feet apart. Back then, the science supported those decisions. I do not feel that it currently does. My friends have a choice to get vaccinated. I thought that this is what we needed in order to get life back to normal. Apparently, a vaccine was not enough. What is enough? When will I have a say? The fact is, if you were to ask my peers what they wanted, they would actually tell you that they do not want to wear masks any longer. What's funny is we actually kind of do not wear them. There are too many kids and too little teachers. Half the time, the masks are under their noses or on their chin. Professionals say that in order for them to work, they have to actually be worn correctly. Respect is earned, not demanded. I have been respectful and compliant, and I continue to be. However, we deserve to have a say and a voice on something that impacts us eight hours a day, five days a week. To say we don't mind the masks is ignorance. I would implore you, the board, to come join me tomorrow at 7.45 as my day starts and complete the day finishing at 3.18. And then let's have a conversation about your experience. What did the day look like to you as you were me for the day? It's hard to breathe, hard to concentrate, hard to hear what the teacher is saying, and it's especially hard to tell how someone is feeling. Our feelings matter. Our mental and social health matter. Please respect us and make masks optional. Thank you. Brad Drabach, Leicester Elementary. You have a tough act to follow. Yeah, that's really unfortunate <laughs> to call that. Nice, nice job, with that. All right, uh, thank you. My, my name is Brad Drabach. I have a uh, kindergartner at Leicester. Um, I don't like many of you. This is my first board meeting. It's super exciting. Um, <laughs> so, they're not all like this. Yeah, yeah. Can't wait for the next one about the chalkboard or whatever. You should come to curriculum. Um, so anyway, I, I, I do want to say thank you to the board and to Dr. Russell. I've, I've reached out to several of you, whether it's on Twitter or email, and you're always very responsive and, and getting back to me. And I, I do enjoy the conversation. Um, you know, I, I came here tonight originally intending to talk about the mounds of evidence that support uh, mask optional, talk about other states that are doing it, talk about the data, but I think most of us in here uh, understand that at this point. So what I really want to talk about is, um, you know, if and when the board does decide to go mask optional, I think we need to be respectful of everybody on, on all sides of this issue. Um, I think as someone already mentioned, you know, there are going to be folks that, that and, and children that choose to wear masks, and that's what we want to support. We want to support the choice for everyone to make the choice for themselves. Um, and what, what that really means is that everyone just has different value systems about, about risk, right? Um, this is not really about science at this point. It's really about um, your, your own morals about valuing risk and the costs and benefits of that. And so I think we have to be respectful of, of folks that are on the other side that um, you know, will choose to continue to wear masks and, and make sure that it's not an issue uh, in our schools. Because I think particularly for young students, um, you know, while it's easy for one side or the other to, to you know, kind of ostracize each other and, and make, make and, and have bullying happen. That's not what we want in our schools. Um, the last point that I want to make is that, you know, I think while, while the board is ultimately hopefully going to make the right decision, I, I'd like this to be a learning moment for all parents. Um, you know, me in particular, I wish I had s s um, spoken out earlier. And I think it's just uh, a little bit of a, uh, it occurs to me that it's something that I need to be doing more. And I think all parents should take pride in their children's education and make sure that we're standing up for, for what we believe in. Um, so I encourage this to be a learning moment for all of us. Thanks. Thank you. Ryan Ullman. My name is Ryan Ullman, and I have a student at Leicester. I'd like to start by recognizing the incredible, difficult task this board has assumed of balancing our children's education needs with the safety of the community at large during this pandemic. I think, by and large, 
the board has done a good job of ensuring that our children receive the education they deserve over these last two years. With that being said, you have been presented with the opportunity to take the next step and allow our kids to go to school mask free. The forced masking has gone on for far too long and it has been negatively impacting our child's education and mental well-being from its onset. Dr. Russell and the board temporarily made the correct decision on forced masking before the school year started when they announced that the mask would be optional for all students. At that time, the vaccines were only available for children 12 and up, and they are now available for children five and up. Vaccines are now available for the overwhelming majority, if not every student in the district. Any parent in the district can choose to vaccinate their child and protect them against COVID-19. It is irresponsible to force all of the kids to wear a mask all day because some other parents think it may benefit their child. It is unfair to sacrifice the quality of everyone's education in order to pacify the fears of a few. My son's reading and speech skills have unnecessarily suffered for far too long as a result of this forced mask. Instead of complying with the Southern Illinois court order, our governor has doubled down and appealed the decision. The governor has not offered any roadmap or metrics on what it will take to lift this mandate. We are now over two years into this and our leaders in government still don't have a plan. We have been very patient, but we cannot afford to wait on the will of our leaders in Springfield any longer. It has been a purely political issue for a long time, and it is a time we stop using our kids as political pawns for the benefit of grown adults. It is Dr. Russell's and the board's duty to prioritize, prioritize our children's education over the politics of forced masking. We must take a stand and vote to stop the forced masking of our kids. Thank you. Uh, Lisa Hinsberger, also Lester. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm a mom in this community with a preschooler and a kindergartner. I'm here because I no longer want to mask my children. I do not see any benefits of it anymore. I do think that there was a time and a place for pandemic restrictions, including masks. However, when they were put in place, it was always with the understanding that they would be removed as soon as possible. And now the circumstances have changed and cases are declining. The science has changed too. We finally have a vaccine. We know that it protects us against the virus and everyone five and older have free access to it. We also know about the one way masking, which is the whole idea that even if other people around you are not wearing a mask, but you are wearing a high quality one, it will protect you. People have the choice to wear double masks, face shields, protective glasses, gloves, you name it. And I should have a choice to not wear those things. Our children wear masks for eight hours straight every single day, and they are not allowed to take them off. Let me repeat this, they are not allowed. Do you hear how that sounds? <laughs> they are not allowed to remove something off their own face, and if they do, they get into trouble. It's just not right. And then the data is so overwhelming on the mask topic. Masks cause low oxygen, high carbon dioxide level, shortness of breath, increased fear, anxiety, headaches, and other problems that we all gonna mention tonight. But you are the people who are not allowing to take them off, you guys. So no one needs a medical degree to know that people need fresh air, especially our kids. So Dr. Russell, the rest of the board members, it is really not too late to turn this around. It's not too late to win our trust back and by giving us back the choice of being in charge of our own children again. So please, I am here begging all of you. It's such a simple request. Please hear us. Please see all of us here. We all here tonight. We asking you, we begging you, we're pleading you to please take these masks off our kids. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Debbie Robertson. My name is Debbie Robertson. I'm a mother of two boys, one that is still in uh, District 58 at Hillcrest School. The last two years have been incredibly stressful for all involved, parents, teachers, administrators, board members, but most importantly, the students. There is a quote that says, a smile is a light in the window of the soul. 
The last two years, I've seen a dimness come over our children. Their bright, beautiful lights are being diminished because we are literally covering up a large part of what makes them who they are. Michaela and Megan's stories are proof of that. I've seen the own change in my own children. And I've, um, I've, my own teachers, son's teachers have taught, told me that the only time that they see my son be like who he used to be and smile like he used to be is when he has afforded a mask break. I know you are here to try and figure out the right thing to do, but making decisions based out of fear will never win. History has shown us over and over again, light and hope always wins out over fear and darkness. We know this virus does not affect children the same way it do affects adults. The data shows us that, and that's something no matter which side you're on, can't be disputed. Study after study has shown us that masks, especially the ones children and teachers wear, are not effective in protecting children from the virus. The harm that wearing masks are doing far outweigh any misguided and misinformed decisions to wear them. The district has listened to the Follow the Silence proclamation many times, and the science shows that the masks do more harm and do not offer protection for the length of time kids are being asked to wear them from spreading or contracting the virus. In fact, there is no data that shows that school masks have an impact on community spread. Enough is enough, and our children, and I say this respectfully, but our children, not yours, do deserve better and are longer going to follow a mandate that is illegal. Since the start of the pandemic, you have said many times that you were looking for a way to navigate this. And Dr. R Russell and fellow board members, I commend you for how you have handled this. You are much braver than District 99 and how you're handling this. I will conclude with just respectfully asking for you to please unmask our children. Thank you. Thank you. Jamie Sparger. Good evening. My name is Jamie Sparger, and I stand here before you tonight as the mother of two District 58 students, excuse me, <laughs> with a third and fourth to come in the year following years. Over the past two years, the board has been faced with challenges we never expected. I think that's something we can all agree on. Superintendent Russell and members of the board, I commend you for much of what you have done and do not envy the position you have been put in. Yesterday, the governor of Illinois declared that he would be removing mask mandates for public spaces, but not schools. <laughs> COVID is declining right here in Illinois, and yet our children are going to continue to carry the burden. Why? In an interview on February 7th with CNN medical analyst Dr. Lena Wen, she states, the first restriction removed should actually be the restriction on children. There actually is harm that we should be discussing of children continuing to mask. We should be intellectually honest and say that masking has had a cost, especially for the youngest learners, people with English as a second language, children with learning disabilities. There has been a cost to them. My first grader has a learning disability with relation to reading. Imagine how much harder it has been for him to navigate that with masks and muffled speech. In October of 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association declared a national emergency in the children's mental health crisis, citing the serious toll of the COVID-19 pandemic on top of existing challenges. In a statement from the AAP president, she stated, young people have endured so much throughout this pandemic, and while much of the attention is often placed on its physical health consequences, we cannot overlook the escalating mental health crisis facing our patients. Today's declaration is an urgent call to policymakers at all levels of government. We must treat this mental health crisis like the emergency that it is. The CDC found that between March and October of 2020, emergency department visits for, for mental health emergencies rose 24% for children ages 5 to 11, 31% for ch children ages 12 to 17. Emergency department visits for suspected suicide attempts increased nearly 51% among girls aged 12 to 17 in 2021 compared to that same time period in 2019. We have an opportunity to stand up and be a voice for these children are suffering. When does the possibility of spreading COVID become less of a concern than the reality of a mental health crisis in our youth? I come from a family of suicide laws and no family should have to endure that. The numbers are declining. The variants of COVID are becoming less and less deadly. There are vaccines and treatments available that were two years ago. The time is now, please. Thank, Thank you. you.
Carrie Antonopoulos. Good evening. I'm Carrie Antonopoulos. I'm the parent of a fourth and sixth grader at Highland Elementary. I'm here to ask that masks should be optional in District 58 for the following reasons. Number one, vaccines are widely available to everyone over the age of five. Number two, all staff have been vaccinated, which protects the most vulnerable demographic from severe disease and death. Number three, boosters are widely available to any staff member who wants additional protection. Number four, the CDC has said that cloth masks provide almost no protection against COVID. What little protection they do provide assumes they are worn correctly, which is rarely the case in school-age kids. Number five, one-way masking with a high-quality N95 mask prevents COVID, no matter what others are doing, and there is an ample supply of such masks available. Number six, many other Western nations have never or only briefly masked children during the pandemic. The U.S. stands out for its aggressive masking of young kids. Number seven, many surrounding states do not have school mask mandates in place and there is no meaningful discrepancy in the health outcomes between their children and those in Illinois. Number eight, children have never been the at-risk group for death by COVID. Their survivability rate is greater than 99.99%. When vaccinated, their risk proceeds to zero. There has not been a single COVID-related pediatric death in DuPage County for the entirety of the pandemic. Number nine, risk is relative. For example, kids are six times more likely to die in a car accident than they are for death by COVID. But who among us doesn't put their kids in a car at least twice a day, if not more? Eliminating all risk is an unreasonable objective. Number 10, masking in schools is not without significant developmental and societal costs. In summary, with the advent of life-saving vaccines, effective therapeutics, and an abundant supply of high-quality masks, there is no longer a scientifically valid reason to universally mask in school. To the people who don't feel safe unmasking their kids, I say, then don't. You have every tool you need to keep your child safe in the form of vaccines and high-quality one-way masks, regardless of what the rest of us are doing. Masks should be optional, not compulsory in District 58. Thank you. Rebecca Edelman, Whittier, Herrick. My name is Rebecca Edelman. I have two kids in District 58. If you aren't wearing a mask, I hope you die. That's a message that many Downers Grove North students received this week. It was written by one of their peers. That's where we are. We're in a place where the inability of leaders from every level of a government to make decisions has poisoned our kids. We are aware it starts in Springfield and it is abysmal. When we were kids, we challenged authority. That was our job and we were pretty good at it. While we frustrated adults, we under we, they understood that kids learn best by trial and error. Letting kids challenge rules was known as the best way to raise kids who have a firm understanding of a firm understanding of consequence, have learned right from wrong, and are independent thinkers. <coughs> Somehow, throughout this pandemic, kids have lost the, nature, the natural instinct to challenge rules. The constant barrage of fear from parents, the media, and most notably teachers and school officials has paralyzed an entire generation. I see it in my sons and their peers. Kids who should be trying to find creative ways to get out of wearing masks have conformed to the point that they are afraid to go without. If you talk to them, they really don't seem to understand what they are afraid of. They spit out talking points that they have been force fed. Encouraging this fear in our kids is going to have long-term consequences, not just on them, but on society. How does a generation built on conformity grow to be critical thinkers, inventors, and creators? How does a generation rooted in going along with the status quo produce leaders with courage to make hard choices? Can they? Please really, really reflect on that. It most certainly is not rhetorical. This generation is paralyzed by fear, and how will they ever go on to be as great as the generations before them? Please end this for our kids. Thank you. Brian Sewell.
Good evening. Thank you. Thank you for having this meeting. <clears throat> I would like to start by recognizing this young lady here who's my daughter. Lucy enthusiastically made the decision to attend Whittier without a mask this week. She is tired of masks. She was immediately segregated from her classmates and has had to work out of the library all week, just her and her sister. Lucy, I admire your courage. I know it was not easy or fun, but I know your actions played a role in getting this board to listen tonight and reconsider the mask mandate. You are my girl. The, the extension of the mandatory masking is a policy unsupported by science or law. It is illegal and it is unjust. We appreciate the district reconsidering the mandatory masking of our children and ask for an immediate end to masking, testing, and the segregation of our children. The chaos of the last four days can end in a vote tonight to end the masking. Failure to end the policy will cast the community into further chaos and division. Dozens of parents have already initiated the process to sue the district if this is not uh, struck down today. Um, claims against surety bonds are already underway for numerous officials in both school districts. We will not stand by idly while you segregate our children, creating a two-tiered system of education, one for the masks and one for those who choose to breathe. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Kathleen Ramsey. Kathleen Ramsey. Good evening, my name is Kathleen Ramsey. My youngest is a sixth grader at Puffer. Thank you, Dr. Russell and school board for your time and always being so respectful. I would like to share just a couple stories with you. During my fall of 2020 semester, I had a student religiously come to office hours to ask a question here and there, or just have a quiet space to work. A month or so later in the semester, I was walking down to make copies. I see her eating in a study nook. My first and most immediate action was to gasp and without pausing say, you are stunning. Followed by, I have to go because I'm gonna start crying. That is when I realized I missed my students. I missed their faces. I missed their expressions. I missed their confused look as I speak a foreign math language to them. I feel a responsibility to speak on the behalf of the District 58 teachers who feel they can't use their voice in fear of losing their job. We have amazing teachers who are burnt out or just numb. Teachers have always taken on the role of so much more than being a teacher. There are nurse, they are nurses, counselors, possibly your child's biggest fan, an encourager, a safe person, and so much more. We have a compounded this list in the last two years. We feel alone. We have been ashamed, we've been shamed for possibly making the decision to be not vaccinated and then further discriminated against when we have to test each week when we clearly know vaccinated individuals can get and transmit COVID. If, if we don't comply, we lose our job. This is not a choice. I realize this was a decision was, that was forced upon you as a district, but that ISB does not have authority to create a mandate about a vaccine. At this point, this mandate has been deemed unlawful, and I would anticipate the district to no longer enforce the discriminatory weekly testing required for teachers. On Wednesday, I was gifted the opportunity, just a little bit more. I was gifted the opportunity to work firsthand in a preschool outside of this district with the students with sensory and nonverbal issues. The battle alone to keep a mask on is not one I want, nor should I have to follow. How can these children even have a chance to speak or feel comfortable to speak when something over their mask is telling them not to speak? I'm asking you to have to all be brave with me and take the next step. It's time to have some changes. A wise friend said to this to me the other day, bravery isn't doing the easy things or the hard things without any fear. It's looking the hard things in the face and doing them while you are scared. Thank you. Thank you. John Lowe. Thank you for your time tonight. Um, I would like to say that I am fully on board with the superintendent's recommendation and I will take it on faith that given the audience today that the board will also vote and support the superintendent's recommendation. And I 
want to take this time to urge you to stay the course in the future. If case counts arise, stay the course. This is the right decision. It should not affect future decisions on whether or not to reimpose a mask mandate or other forms of illegal quarantine. Um, I think I'm a lawyer and a scientist. I'm detail oriented. I took a look at the DuPage County COVID-19 dashboard for the first time today for the entire pandemic and I was shocked by what I saw. So first of all, community transmission is high, but it is high for 99.1% of all counties in the United States. I don't know what criteria the CDC uses, but it seems to indicate that there's no detectable difference in transmission um, associated with mask mandates. Also, this, I was surprised to see that the seven-day rolling average of kids aged 0 to 19 that have been hospitalized with COVID has not exceeded two in the entire time frame covered by the dashboard, which is April 2021 to present. So the peak, I also looked at the peaks. The peak of the seven-day rolling average positive case count was January 10th. For ages 0 to 59, the sum of the averages was 1,981 cases because everyone ran out and got tested because of what we were hearing in the media. However, the sum of the seven-day rolling average of hospitalizations with COVID for that same day in the same demographic was three. The increase in deaths has been overwhelmingly for those ages 60 and up, and this is something that I think has become clear from the data from the get-go, uh, you know, early in the pandemic. So I want to say that 80% of DuPage County residents aged 12 and older have taken the jab. There's no correlation between positive case counts and hospitalizations and presumably deaths, but the dashboard doesn't provide data on deaths by age group. I just want to say to the people in the community, the board, those under 60 should not be living in fear of COVID-19 unless they have known comorbidities. And those under 0 to 19 are at negligible risk of hospitalization due to COVID. So please stay the course, even if case counts go up. There is no connection between positivity rates, case counts, and serious illness and death. Thank you. <laughs> Megan Landis. Megan Landis. Oh, Landers. It's like weirdly dim, and then that thing is shining <laughs> in my eye. It's hard to read. Hi. Um, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight. I, I just want to start off, I guess, first by saying um, thank you. Just thank you for all that you've done. I feel incredibly, incredibly fortunate to be part of this district. Um, I've always had my emails responded to. I, I've always been respected, and I just thank you for that. Um, I thought long and hard about what I wanted to talk about tonight and what would make the most impact on your decision to move to a mask optional model. Um, I could focus on the learning loss, the mental health crisis, the hypocrisy, the fact that the CDC said cloth masks were ineffective and children don't wear them correctly, or the fact that 45 states already lifted their school mask mandates. But tonight I wanted to briefly talk about my two school-aged children and how this has impacted them. And then I wanted to outline how you do have the authority to move to an optional model, but you already got that memo, so I'm going to skip that. Um, my daughter is a third grader and she does quite well in school. She's a rule follower and she loves school. She was new to Whittier last year. She struggled daily trying to connect to her classmates, first over Zoom and then in person. She often cried to me not knowing if anyone liked her because she couldn't see behind their masks if they were smiling or frowning when she said something. Um, this will have an effect on our children. I don't know to what extent, but it will. She is now so conditioned to wear a mask that she's scared to take it off. Fear of someone being mad at her or breaking the rules. As a nation, we have instilled fear in our most impressionable and we have to move away from this and start to heal. My son, a kindergartner, hasn't seen a day without a mask since he was three years old. He has a 504 plan for sensory issues, anxiety, academic struggles, struggles, and an eye disorder called convergence efficiency that makes it difficult to focus on letters and words. His mask is often riding up, getting in the way of his peripheral vision, and causing this condition to worsen. I, I truthfully don't know what toll this will take on him long term. Um, and just to summarize, we can't wait for clearer guidance. Clearer guidance is not coming. If 200 people, 20,000 people can gather inside a venue to watch a concert, 20 children can be in a classroom together. This is no longer, this is 
is no longer about the children. It is not about health and safety. And unfortunately, this is completely political. Please do not let our governor, driven by financial gains and an allegiance to big teachers unions, continue to tell you what is best for our school district. Our children should not have to carry this burden. Please, please make it optional. Thank you. Mike Allendorf. Mike Allendorf. Thank you. I just showed up because my wife was worried everyone was going to argue for pro mask, and that seems like it's not the case. <laughs> so I think you guys have all the reasons. It seems like we're moving in the right direction. I think my only other comment would be, if, if not now, when? I think the frustrating part has been, there's no metrics, there's no, like, if we get to here, it's just been, like, shut up and do it, and there's no, there's no end date. So if it's somehow not going to happen, I think we'd just like to know when or why or what would it cause to happen. So thank you. I think the parents are awesome. I think this is great that we're finally all standing up, and this is pretty incredible. Kim Breyer. Good evening and thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Dr. Russell and members of the board, I really appreciate your time. My name is Kim Breyer and I'm the mother to seven children. I have four students to attend Kingsley and one at O'Neill. I have had the privilege of speaking before this board in the past, serving four years on the executive board on the, for the Kingsley PTA as a chairperson for our playground committee and as a concerned parent regarding sidewalks and stop signs and a slew of other things. I have been trusted to raise tens of thousands of dollars for this district. I have given more of my time than I can even begin to calculate to you and give to you. My point in telling all of you this in this very moment is that I've been trusted to do all of those things, but right now I cannot decide what is best for my kids in the building of their, in the walls of their school. I do believe that we have the same goals, that our children deserve to have a wonderful experience while attending school in our district. For the last two years, we have done what you've asked, Dr. Russell. We have been patient. We allowed you and this board to decide what our new norm would look like, and we waited. We complied. Our lives look nothing like they once did, and I had trust in you that you were working hard on a means to an end. After having a conversation with our children, who expressed that they wanted to be just like their cousins, teammates, and friends in other districts and have a choice, we decided that we would support them on Monday and send them to school without masks. Four of them made the choice not to do that, or to not wear masks. Their choice. To my crew at home, I am so proud of you. I have been called names this last week that you cannot imagine, that I'm disrespectful or that I don't appreciate the teachers in my building. Nothing could be further from the truth. I have so much respect for our staff that on Sunday I placed a personal call to our school principal. I told her what she could expect from my kids on Monday and I asked her what the day looked like for them. I care about both sides. I am not a reckless individual. I am a mother who canceled all Christmas festivities because we had symptoms of COVID. I know this virus has turned lives upside down and I do not suggest that you remove all mitigations. But taking away a family's right to choose what is best for them is not the answer here. I do have a statement from my nine-year-old daughter if you will allow me to read that. Hi, my name is Emma Breyer and I'm in third grade at Kingsley School. Mr. Biederman is my teacher and he's awesome. I am nine years old. Thank you for letting my mom read this to you tonight. I am at dance because I had made a commitment to my team. I wanted to tell you why I went to school without a mask this week. Spelling is super hard for me because I can't see my teachers and friends' mouths and the way they are moving with the mask on. And the mask makes some letters sound a lot alike. I would like to take my mask off if it meant that it would help me in school. I work really hard all the time, but it doesn't seem to make it any easier. 
This week I didn't wear a mask because I've been taught that if I see something that's wrong to say something. I was put in a different room than my friends and I didn't have anyone teaching me. I did work on my iPad and finished all of my homework early. I got to see my friends at recess and lunch. On Monday when I went to school there was a teacher I didn't know who jumped in front of me when I was trying to go into my classroom and wouldn't let me go in. It scared me. Yesterday Mr. Biederman let my friends write me letters. They told me how much they miss me and that they love me and how much they want me back in my classroom. I told them that I miss them too, but I know that I'm doing something very important. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Lindsay Garrity. Thank you. Like Megan, I can remove a, a few paragraphs since we seem to be on the same page here. My name is Lindsay Garrity and I have three children in District 58. We have, three son we have two sons at Kingsley and one at Grove. Brave, heroic, flexible, resilient superheroes. These are all words we've heard echoed describing our children throughout the pandemic. And they are because they have to be. They're resilient because COVID mitigations are inflexible. They are brave. Be they are brave but it is shameful the weight of the pandemic has been on their shoulders. There's not enough time to tell you about the challenges that our children have faced over the last two years. Our second grader has ADHD now. Our first grader who thrives in school is now being evaluated for speech and has developed an articulation issue due to wearing a mask. But what I am gonna tell you today is about our four-year-old. Theo is enrolled at Grove and will be at Kingsley in the fall. He has been yeah, yeah. Theo is an enrolled at Grove and he will be at Kingsley in the fall. After two surgeries as a baby, he started physical and speech therapy at six months old. He has been diagnosed with a severe verbal apraxia and he has a motor planning delay. We sought help early and often as suggested, and he has been in occupational, physical, speech, and developmental therapy. We wanted nothing more than for him to be accepted to Grove because we know that they, they were the most talented and gifted therapists and preschool teachers in our state. When he turned three in April of 2020, he began his journey remotely. We were flexible. We missed speech minutes and instruction because we were all in this together. We are no longer in the same boat when Neighboring districts and schools within our the own village are mask optional. Our private speech therapist and pediatrician wrote letters explaining how critical it was that our son had the ability to easily move his lips, jaw, and tongue muscles in order to overcome the impact that verbal apraxia has on him. When Theo's mouth is covered with, by a mask, he cannot effectively make speech sounds, period. But our medical exemption was denied by District 58. As our son makes the transition to kindergarten, we are told he may need classroom RTI support already. We have, we have put him in private speech and tutoring throughout the pandemic because we are trying all that we can. That will help him learn and grow despite his obstacles. While we are so proud of his accomplishments and constant positive attitude, I will never forgive myself for the progress he could have made over the last two years. I am in awe of our teachers, therapists, and aides. Their dedication and love is why our children love school so much. For forcing any child, let alone a child with special needs, to wear a mask is not only sinful, it is counterproductive to the hard work in the classroom and the efforts we're making outside of school. Many will argue, to my community, many will argue that masking is a small inconvenience. To some families, it is not. Some of our children have had to learn to read without seeing their teacher's faces or mouth. They have had to make friends without seeing their classmates' faces. And our son has had to learn to say his own name when he cannot use his mouth with a mask. We all want our children to remain healthy and to grow and learn. Please be kind to one another. Have compassion for all the families as you do not know what they are facing. I beg you tonight to please make masks optional.
Matthew Culp. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Matthew Colt. I've lived in Downers Grove my whole life. I actually went to Bel Air and I went to Downers Grove North. That guy right there was the officer at North. Hey, what's up, man? How you doing? Great guy, fantastic. He never arrested me. Uh, <laughs> I think this is, for the most part, pretty much wrapped up and I don't really need to state any facts. The only thing that we need to do as a community is to be kind and not judge. There are going to be families. There are going to be families that are going to have a hard time with this. I'm not going to have a hard time with it, but there are going to be other families that are going to have a hard time. Some families are going to have to send their kids to school with masks. They have pre parents have pre-existing conditions. Elderly people might live at their house. Some might have diabetes. Some just might not be healthy people. So I think as a community, we need to come together, show each other respect, don't judge, be kind, and love one another as we go mask optional. Chantel Smith. former District 58 family. I pulled my four children two years ago because I disagreed with the current mandates. Um, I don't think I can add any additional facts or statistics that everybody hasn't already said tonight. I think the one thing that I would like to say is that we are not on the cutting edge of making this decision. We are one of nine states, probably fewer now, that have a mask optional um, choice. The data exists in those states that the death rate does not increase due to a mask optional environment. That is important is the death rate, not the you contracted COVID but survived rate. COVID is not going to disappear. The vaccine does not prevent spread. It just reduces your symptoms. We cannot stay in fear of getting sick. And I moved my children because I don't want to co-parent with the governor, with IDPH or ISBE. We need to let parents assess their child's risk, allow them to choose. This is America where freedom of choice needs to be preserved. I do appreciate the difficult position, as the man previously before me said. Not everybody's going to be happy, um, but thank you for giving the time, past time, I'm sure, for everyone to speak tonight. Thank you. While we've reached our hour mark, I only have one card left, so uh, let's just continue going on. Barbara Allen. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, thank you so much, Dr. Russell, for your leadership. Um, you've been wonderful um, throughout all of this, and we just so appreciate your leadership. Thank you for the board for being here and for listening to all of us tonight. Um, I am a mother of four children. I have one daughter currently at District 99, one who graduated from District 99 last year, and two children in District 58. When my seventh grader gets home from school and I ask her how her day was, her words are often overshadowed by mask policy and mask theater at school. There is constant lecturing and pestering from certain teachers about how to properly wear a mask. They have been measured at the lunch tables with a yardstick to make sure they are properly distanced. This is abhorrent. These teachers, I'm not speaking for all teachers, but those teachers are on a power trip. It's not okay. 
We all want to move past COVID, yet politics leads us to believe there is only one solution, masks. Yet thousands of schools across the country have been open during the entire pandemic without masks and no corresponding rise in serious illness. Kids are getting sick from all kinds of viruses, all kinds of things other than COVID, despite wearing masks. Here are the facts. And these facts are available to each and every one of us. Over the course of the pandemic, 49,000 children have died of all, all causes. Only 331 of those were COVID related. Yet we have turned our children's lives upside down at school for what is essentially a non-risk. Last year, fewer kids died of COVID-19 than of heart disease, cancers, tumors, suicide, homicide, and drownings. Are we inspecting at school what's in our children's lunches? Are we addressing the growing incidences of suicides during the pandemic? No, we are playing politics with our children's faces. It is a fact that masking children negatively impacts learning and their social and emotional well-being. Outside of school, we have maskless gatherings, concerts, restaurants, stadiums, and more. Yet in school, our children still have a cloth plastered over their beautiful faces. Where is the common sense in that? Yes, the Illinois Attorney General has appealed the recent ruling by Judge Raylene Grish Grishow regarding our governor's COVID school mandates. However, Judge Grishow was quite clear in her ruling. These mandates are not legal. It is It's not uncoincidental that the government announced just yesterday that he will finally lift mandates in public spaces by the end of the month. COVID-19 has reached its endemic stage. Yes, it's more contagious, but importantly, it is less virulent. We are approaching our third year of living with COVID-19. We cannot remain at a heightened state of emergency. We have to move past mitigations. We need to stop using our children as pawns in pandemic politics. About 15 Board. seconds, okay? Please. Board, I implore you to please unmask our children now. Give parents the choice. Give families the choice. End all mitigations and declare masks optional in District 58. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes, concludes our, our public comment portion. We're now going to move on to our recommendations for action. We have one item on our docket tonight. That is the, the potential action to authorize the suspension of enforcement of certain COVID mitigation measures to the extent consistent with court rulings. Is there a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing a suspension of enforcement of certain COVID-19 mitigation measures to the extent consistent with court rulings and approving the superintendent's authority related to pandemic operations for the 2021-2022 school year? So moved. Second. All right, with that, I'll open it up for discussion. I guess I'll, I'll go first. I'm gonna be really, really quick, um, and then I'll actively listen to my fellow board members. But um, I think the gentleman in the back said it uh, very nicely, like, if not now, when is it gonna be? And so for me, we're never gonna- Check, check, check. <laughs> Uh, Mike's working. Check, check one. J James, how are we doing? All right. No, I, I guess uh, uh, for me, we're never going to get an all clear sign. Um, we simply aren't. So, so now's the time to, to move forward. So that's all I have to say. stood out in the slide deck and moving forward and I think uh, one of the last guys brought it up I think his name is Matthew um, there's gonna be a difference of opinion here obviously um, but the seven of us for the last two and a half two and a half years have put the kids first and when we were met with adversity when people thought the school should be closed we didn't do that so when all the So when all the talk um, in the last week or so, um, the things that have been said, and I want to just capitalize on something that you said, uh, Kevin, about our community. It's 
it's really disgusting what I see happening on both sides. Nobody is exempt from this because everyone is misbehaving, everybody. But something that I, I have to say that two years ago when I sat here and when all of us sat here, we got emails saying that we were gonna pay for a kid's funeral because we were keeping schools open when they thought it should be closed. And just recently, we got an email from somebody saying that they were sickened and disgusted by the administration and Board of Education, and they were disappointed to be part of the community in this school district because their children deserve so much better. All the children deserve better, and you and the school board should be ashamed of yourselves because we don't care about kids and what's best for them, that we're backed by money, politics, and power, and we only care about ourselves and our reputation. And I have to say that I, can t I have pretty thick skin, but when it comes to comments like that, I really have a hard time understanding how Kevin gets out of bed every morning and goes to work with a smile <laughs> on his face and all the building principals that have to take it on the chin every single day, no matter what, from both sides of the coin. And what I want to know moving forward is how we can work with the kids and make this as seamless as possible if it were to be approved tonight and, and have everybody put your drama aside and your hyperbole and let's talk about how we can make everybody comfortable on both sides of the coin. So that, that's my question to you, Kevin, is to ask how we can help support kids if this were to be approved tonight to be comfortable and the things we have in place for the next couple days or moving forward social, emotionally, and whether families choose to have a mask or not, how we're going to handle that. So one of the things that we've spent a lot of time talking about this week is if, if the board approves a mask optional policy, the people that our kids trust the most are the classroom teachers in front of them. And there's no one better to talk with our kids tomorrow than their classroom teachers and talk to them about a transition, um, what that would look like, how to respect everyone's choice because we will have if the board approves several students who still choose to wear a mask um, speaking with districts that have gone mask optional already um, you know they're not reporting that you know the school is mask free it, it looks very similar to what it does now a lot of people especially at the start are still sending their children to mask or with masks excuse me so I think one of the first things that we've got to do is we've got to talk to our kids and make sure that kids aren't questioning one another about how come you don't have a mask or, or you know why why don't you have a mask and making sure that everyone feels comfortable with, with everyone's choice and again what we'd like to do tomorrow is first and foremost meet with our principals first thing in the morning at 7 a.m. share with them talking points that our teachers can use because remember our, our teachers are, are home for the evening and, and they'll be coming in at 8 a.m. tomorrow so it's not like they can take the time to meet and have these big you know things so We'd like to take some time, be very deliberate with that. And then what we'd like to do on Monday during our um, early release time is to pull our teachers back and talk about what went well, what didn't go well, what can we improve on? Because the one thing I can tell you from the districts that have gone mask optional is that every day is a new learning opportunity. I think we've seen that throughout the pandemic. And so how are we making sure that we check in uh, with our teachers and our kids and uh, just take that deliberate time? So I know people are super, super anxious. You know, I am as well. Um, but taking that time tomorrow to really talk to the kids is, is important. And, you know, setting them up for success for Monday. So on top of that, just because um, I used to work in radio and people would call in and say, what's that, that advertiser? And I heard it like every hour. And I was like, how could you not remember the phone number of that company that <laughs> advertises every hour? How, how are we going to work getting information out? Is there going to be like an FAQ or whatever so that it, do you, under, do you, yeah. do you see what I'm laying down here? So like what, how are we going to get it? So everyone understands moving forward what the new canvas is. So first and foremost, you know, Megan Hewitt and I have been working on, and actually I should give Megan all the credit because Megan's been working on, uh, <laughs> draft communications that would go out um, later tonight informing the community of the decision for those that aren't watching, whatever the board decides to vote on, okay? If it is a mask optional policy, we would send a uh, notice to our staff, we would send a notice to the families, and uh, that's the first step in it. We have a return to learn plan on the website that would then have to be updated okay. uh, so people could go back and look because 
Again, when you look at the guidance, go to the CDC page, what it talks about is layered mitigations. And so if you're taking a few away, you still keep some in. And, and quite honestly, um, with lunchroom tables, how everything is set up right now, classrooms, we're not going to be able to go back to all 13 schools and rearrange everything tomorrow. It's going to take some time to get back to, you know, what it looked like step at a time, you know, and uh, so we do need some time to, to go back and, and speak with them. So again, that meeting on Monday with our staff after the first day should the board approve is really essential to, to take a look at that, but we will be continually, you know, updating our families and updating our information that we have on the website. Okay. Um, well, because if we've already, it was still discussion. I, I would just say that in doing my research for tonight, uh, the seven day rolling average in the two zip codes that our school district is in is at 5.35%. And the vaccination rate in DuPage County, uh, in our specific uh, zip codes, the two zip codes that are for District 58, fully vaccinated is 77% and 72%. Mm -hmm. So because of these things um, and knowing that we're not an outlier anymore, that it's not like we're the first district to do something like this. Other states have been doing it for a long time. I feel, I feel comfortable in this and I really do appreciate all the time that your administration has taken to put this together and I appreciate it seeing that it doesn't take effect tomorrow that you're suggesting for Monday because by the time we all get out of here it could be later and kids are going to bed so there's no opportunity so I appreciate the time and consideration for both staff and for families to kind of wrap their head around it and have the weekend also to discuss and decide as a family so I appreciate that and I appreciate that you mentioned staff because one of the the things that you know you hear on the media is that um, you know there, there's an angry teachers union over here there's something like that I want to assure the community our teachers union, we've got a great working relationship. Our teachers union and, and our teachers in District 58, every experience I have had is, is, is for the kids. I haven't had a negative interaction. I haven't been, you know, forced in anything. I, I represent the board and the children and our staff of the district, not one interest here, or one interest there. They've been really great. Um, what they're asking for is information. What they're asking for is a little bit of time to make sure that we do this right. And, um, you know, but again, our teachers are representative of the community. And so there will be some, I'm sure, that are, that are eager to go mask optional, others that may be concerned, and, and we will continue to work through it with, with everyone. But um, I have not had um, negative push like you would see on the news or anything like that. So I, I did want to be clear because I have gotten that question or, you know, accusation. From, from certain individuals in the community, but that isn't the case. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you. Um, so, oh, go ahead. I'll jump in quickly. I, I'm going to try to keep my comments brief as well. Um, first, I, first thing I want to say is just thank you so much to the teachers and the principals and the administration for everyone's extreme amount of hard work and dedication to our community and our families and our students. Um, these people have been working tirelessly they always work tirelessly, but especially throughout the course of the pandemic, the burden that has been put upon them is tremendous. Just as we all know as, as parents and you know people who've lived through this all together, many of our teachers and our principals and our administration are also parents who have children who've lived through these same experiences as we all have. And I'm very, very appreciative of, every, of everything they have done. Um, a couple concerns I have going forward. Um, one thing that, that does, give me pause is that I don't, I'm hesitant in terms of the flip flopping back and forth where we might make a decision tonight to say we're gonna go mask optional beginning on Monday and next Thursday the ruling could be overturned and then we have to go back to full masking. Um, I'm concerned about that aspect of it. Um, that inconsistency and the flip flopping back and forth I think is, is a concern for the students and the staff and everybody involved. Um, I also, as so many people have mentioned, am very frustrated with our state leadership um, and our health departments and kind of their lack of clear direction throughout this entire pandemic. As someone, someone mentioned that um, we as a board have been made to make decisions that we really have no expertise in making and that's very frustrating and challenging as a board member to try to make a decision for 5,000 students when I don't necessarily feel like I have the knowledge necessary to make that decision. So we look to our experts and 
we look to our health department, we look to the CDC, we look to the IDPH, we look to the DuPage County Health Department for guidance. And it is frustrating when that guidance is maybe not as clear as we would like it to be. But that's kind of always been our course as a board, I feel like, since the beginning of the pandemic is we're not doctors, we're not epidemiologists, we're not infectious disease specialists. We don't have that knowledge to make these decisions. So I, and I feel like that was always kind of our course is let's look to those experts. And right now, those experts are still telling us that universal masking is the best course forward. So that's how I have, that's, that's what I Hold have on. to use yeah. as my guidance to make a decision for the majority of families. I'm not only thinking about my own children, I'm thinking about everyone. I'm not thinking about, you know, just my own personal opinion or, or feelings necessarily, but I have to have something to hold on to as a, as a, um, as a path or, or, or a guideline for myself to say I'm not an expert. I don't know anything about infectious diseases. So I look for someone to tell me and to give me some guidance and advice. Hold on a second. Hold on. The, 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 entire, the entire board was very respectful and really tried to listen to the community here. Uh, I understand that not every board member that's going to sit up here tonight is going to say something that you agree with, but please let us have an opportunity to hear from all of our members so that we can come up here and, and t take an accurate vote. I promise you that we're listening to you, and I also want to listen to my fellow board members. So and please that's not a good them. example of what we're asking for should this be approved either, the way you're at that. So please, go ahead, Emma. Thank you. Um, I would love to see... Um, a plan in place for when in the near future this is the direction we are moving our numbers are looking tremendous right now i'm not going to know that i do not want to see masking forever i want to be able to to move forward as soon as possible but i also want to um use the the expertise of the of the medical professionals who have given us guidance all along this this throughout the pandemic and so that's that's kind of where i have to have to land at this time Thank you. I'll go ahead and follow up on Tracy and Emily. Um, I want to say first and foremost, um, I know that there is a faction of our community that is not here tonight that have been very communicative to our board as well um, that may not agree with everything in this room either. I care about, I could support everything going mask optional. I could support everything going fully masked ongoing until we have this, right? I can, find data for both, right? That's not what I'm basing my decision on tonight. I'm looking at what is the authority by which we are making our decisions. And I would like to see us go mask recommended but not required. I do not like what we have in front of us as a resolution. It states very clearly here that it is based off of an appellate court ruling, either keeping or, or um, abolishing the mask mandate by the governor. All along, my decisions have not been made based off of a political figure's mask mandate, nor should they have been. Our state and um, county health departments have not given us any mitigation measures by which to measure our decisions. It's highly unfortunate. I am also a frustrated parent in that front. Um, I something along where Tracy is saying our percentage here our percentage there supports it as well as you know we have vaccination status we have this we have other ways to do this in a way that makes sense that's not going to be flip switch based on the the whim of a court that hasn't even named us yet and the whim of a governor that isn't really looking at our community. I'm in our community. I see both sides of this. I care about every single child. Um, so this is a very frustrating vote for me because I would like to see us go mask recommended, not required. I would not like to see us turn it on and off in the way that this resolution has um, presented us. I don't think this should be our authority. So I guess maybe just elaborate a little bit more about when you see that that off-ramp then you're, you're saying let it play out through the courts no I'm saying I don't see here a basis based on 
what we've always said, which is that we're going to look at the authorities that have the knowledge, right? This is basing it off of court rulings that we are not party to. And I don't agree with that. And I don't think anyone in this room wants to see masks go away. And then if the court rules against you, masks go back on again. I don't think that's the goal of anybody here either. Right. Okay. No, I'm not. I'm saying that you're not having a conversation with them, so keep, say what Oh, yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> apologize. Um, so w what I'm saying here is that my vote on this particular back and forth potential, I can't vote for this one. I want to, I want to see our community have something that they can really hold on to as a go forward. How would, how would that oh, please, like, please stop. This is not a time to engage. Okay, please. Greg, you're up. Greg. Okay, so I'm just going to say a couple things. I'm going to start by saying, Kevin, um, I want to thank you for your, for your leadership here. That was the whole day <laughs> I was, had a pit in my stomach about this meeting because I, I, I saw the level of vitriol in, in, in uh, the Facebook posts and, and the emails that we were getting um, since Friday night. And um, that was... I could never have imagined that this conversation, this, this discourse had been so healthy and so respectful. And I, I thank everyone here for that. And, and Kevin, I want to say, that's, your leadership is a big part of that. And it, it's, it's the way you communicate, and it's the way that you, um, you interact with families and talk to people and you listen and, and you explain everything very clearly. And, and um, that, you know, people, as, people, my friends, they, they send me these, these YouTube videos as a joke. <laughs> like, look at this dysfunctional board here, good luck, you know, that kind of thing. And, and we don't have that here in 58. And I think that you, are, you and your team especially are, are a huge part of that. So thank you to the, on that. Um, I'm going to keep my, my, my comments uh, short. Um, like everyone else in this room, nothing I'm going to say is going to, I don't think it's going to change anybody's minds. Um, I, I, just like everybody else, I've, I've looked at the data. I've weighed the risks. Um, I've, I've um, studied the, the efficacy or lack thereof of, of certain mitigations, and, and, I, and, I, and, I and I've tried to understand the impact that they're going to have on kids in our community. Um, when we were having this co uh, similar conversation in, in uh, July, August of 2020, um, I was uh, very strongly in, in support of keeping our schools open uh, because I was worried about the impact on kids. Um, I think the impacts are different um, when we're having this conversation, but um, they're, they're still worth you know, echoing some of the comments from people in the room about um, that's really hard for a kid to be in a school with um, with an English learner or somebody who has a speech delay or any kind of learning disability to be able to learn in that environment. I think it's 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 hard on some on a lot of the times on kids who are the most vulnerable. Um, I think it's hard for kids to hear their teachers sometimes. I mean, when I when I went for parent teacher conferences or I'm sorry, open house in what was that September? All the fans are going. I could you know, I, I don't have the greatest hearing, but I could barely hear what the teacher was saying. And I think there's there's something to be said about the nonverbal feedback we give each other and how kids need to be seeing that. And that's that's lost a lot of time when you can't see the the face behind the mask. Um, I the one thing that um, I am just as happy about in this recommendation that I think has has been more onerous than, than the masking is the, the, the um, ex exclusion of children from school. And uh, uh, you know, I'll speak for my, uh, a family member who, of mine who uh, got COVID. She was, too, she was too old, she and her brother were too old to be, too young to be vaccinated. Uh, she was sick for a day, she was excluded for 10 days from school and her brother's exclusion, he was home the whole time and he was able to, uh, he was not able to return until he had a 10 days tacked on at the end of her um, exclusion period. So uh, that to me, when we were talking about getting kids in school, and that's, this is the best place for them to be, this is where they need to learn and grow and be with kids and be with teachers who love them and support them. Um, I, I can't, the, 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 the idea of, of keeping to, uh, continuing to keep healthy kids at home um, has, is um, not something that sits well with me, and that's a, that's a celebration for me in this resolution. Um, and then the other thing that just has, has been said, we are not in uncharted territory. We are behind the times in terms of comparing ourselves to other districts in, in, in other states and other countries. Um, this, is, we are not, this is not a, a laboratory experiment. We have, um, we have models in other areas in our, in our country, in our world, where this is working. And I, um, I, I, don't, I, don't have, I don't share the, I don't, I, I don't have the reservations that this is, this is gonna be an unwise move for us. Thank you, Greg. Uh, for me, this is, this is a, a great opportunity to kind of talk because uh, 
I, I've had to write a lot of emails lately. And when, <laughs> <laughs> and when I write them, often if you get an email back from me, it's, it's me representing seven people. And so it, it usually, it's usually a broad conversation making sure I'm representing us as an organization. So to kind of talk a little bit about my philosophy throughout this entire thing is my goal has really been to make sure that kids are in school and that we get things as close to normal as possible. Uh, it, it was a hard fight, you know, back uh, what now is, is two years ago to, to start the school year out in person. And I know a lot of people were afraid and it was something that we had to power through. Um, it was hard to get people to start, you know, to get, get around the idea of having snacks in school and having lunch in school again and, and adding things like recess back and gym class. I mean, every single one of those I know was, was scary and hard for people, but every time we did that and we walked through the fire, we came out the other side, and I think our kids benefited from that. We've been talking for a long time about what can an exit ramp look like, and, and I think we as a district, people ask us that question, and we don't know because it's because we've been bound by so many things. And I was writing a lot of emails over the weekend asking for patience, and a lot of people, I think, were aggravated by that. And the reason why was is I had no idea what the health department was going to tell us. The idea that if we talked to the health department and, they, and we said we were considering this, and they said, well, then anytime you get a COVID case, we're going to shut down a whole class or a whole building, that becomes really punitive to what we're doing. And I was really nervous that um, a step in the right direction may take us a couple of steps back. So we needed those days to really work through that. It, so for me, this is, this is an opening for us to take, to have an opportunity to show, I think, the rest of the state too, as, as so many other districts have had, that, that we can walk through this and we can come out the other side and it, and it can work. Um, I think it's something that I really do support. I, I am nervous about that this could toggle back and forth, but, and, and I, I, that's the part I don't like, but I don't think we can be afraid of that and, and you know, to do that. So, if this should pass here today, I think that, I, I think we have to be ready that that may happen. This is the state of Illinois, and uh, I, I'm not kidding myself on, on it, and so I think as things transition and as we do everything, we just need to continue to be respectful. There was a gentleman earlier today that said there are going to be families and stuff that um, may have legitimate health reasons or just may still be afraid. And uh, Brian, you talked about your daughter, and I know that you felt she felt othered the other day. And we want to make sure that as this transitions the other way that we're not othering anybody else. This is really, really important. We've talked about social emotional health. We've talked about this. And part of this is going to have to come through kindness. I support this. I, I look forward. Um, I look forward to the next step as we go forward in, in getting towards normalcy. I don't think that uh, we're chartering on, this is not unchartered territory. I have a lot of family and friends that live in other states. And, um, and we're just starting to get a little bit closer to, to what school looks like for them. So I'm looking forward to it. I, I have one more question. Is, yeah, the is the COVID dashboard stay the same, like how we do all the reporting and all that stuff? Yeah, so we will continue to, uh, there's a couple of just clarifying points I want to make sure that everybody is aware of. I, so for the community out there, you know, I, I know the board, you know, we, they didn't each take a half hour to talk and I, I, I nobody uh, appreciates that, but <laughs> I cannot thank them enough for the countless phone calls after phone calls after phone call. And, and, they take their time to ask questions. And while you may agree or you may disagree with their decisions, I can assure you it's not because they're not paying attention, they're not asking the right questions, and they're not invested in your children because they are. Um, there is a, a, a possibility of toggling back and forth. Okay, and I, I wanna make sure that everyone understands that. One concern that I have and one concern I, I know every building administrator has is that if a court says, nope, this mandate is legal. School districts, you have to follow it. We cannot have an environment where families are then coming to our school and saying, you know what, we're not gonna obey this and we're gonna do this or that. That is institutional chaos. And if we allow that as a school district, where does it end? 
does it end you know there or, or what if a, a parent doesn't like their teacher is something that was said are they going to come the next day and demand that they go to the room across the hall so we have to have rules and we have to follow them and so i just need to make everyone aware in this gray area time we did the best that we could we were flexible we didn't force kids to go home or anything like that but we cannot have an environment if this thing gets overturned where people are just saying, nope, you know what, I'm not listening to that anymore. And so we, I, I just want to make sure that everyone is on the same page as we go forward with that. Um, because that will come to my office and, and the individuals in the back there are building principals and our classroom teachers. They need to work with the kids. They cannot spend time doing that. And so I just, I can't thank them enough, but they can do that. So I'm famous for taking 10 minutes to actually answer the question that was asked. <laughs> so that Tracy, the, the COVID yeah. dashboard, <laughs> that question I'm glad funny. my wife isn't here right now, but the, the COVID dashboard <laughs> is still up. It is updated daily. I want to thank Dr. Art Miller for that and weekly. So the first page of the COVID dashboard will show you our weekly cases and, and you will see it spikes up and it's come straight back down. Um, the second page is our student cases per day by building. By grade. By, by grade by two, thank by you. Grade. And the third page is our staff cases by day, by school. And then we have staff members that work in multiple buildings, so you would see that. The fourth page is last year. And so if you wanna see what it looked like last year compared to this year, um, it's all on the home page of the website. You just go to about, and then it says COVID-19 information. And again, that's updated every day by four o'clock. Uh, another shout out to our school nurses who are updating that. They've been amazing this year uh, doing all that. Stuff. that i just wanted to know i check it and there was one case in the district today yeah you know? i believe today um, when i checked it there was one student case today i think there were three yesterday uh zero staff cases today that that's the dashboard that i looked at thank you that's awesome thank you and I, I want to ensure that the community as a whole knows those listening at home those in the room our board stands united no matter what votes are we support the children as a whole if the vote doesn't go unanimous those that are not on the unit on the on the side that is on the i vote they support whatever decision and they support the children they support the path moving forward that will not change it never has all right any other final comments nope. all right melissa please call roll member ellis nay member hannes nay member harris aye <coughs> aye Member Olchick. Aye. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried to adopt the resolution. <laughs> carried to adopt the resolution authorizing the suspension of enforcement of certain COVID-19 <laughs> mitigation measures to the extent consistent with court rulings and approving the superintendent's authority related to pandemic operations for the 2021-2022 school year. A couple of announcements. We do have a regular board meeting on Monday, February 14th at 7 p.m. Uh, with a opportunity, a, what we call a community conversation, or we previously called it uh, Coffee with the board, that'll be at 7.30 a.m. before the 7 p.m. I'm sorry, 6.30 p.m., 7 p.m. meeting. And it'll be right here at Village Hall. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Second. All right, Melissa, please call roll. Member Harris. Aye. Member Olchick. Aye. You're welcome. Member Weiner. Aye. Member Ellis. Aye. Member Hannes. Aye. Member Hughes. Aye. The motion carried. The meeting is adjourned now at 6.59 p.m.